The following content is brought to you by Chilton Evangelical Church in Manchester, UK. Our location is M21 9FG. Our Sunday services are at 11 a.m. and 6:30 p.m. For more information, visit our website chiltonevangelical.org. Well, I would encourage you to have your Bibles open at that passage that we just read together a moment ago earlier in our service in Romans and chapter 8. And so this morning, as we continue to make steady, somewhat slow progress through this letter of the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome, I want us to center our thoughts on verse 33 through to verse 37. So that's Romans and chapter 8 and verse 33 through to verse 37. And the title for the sermon this morning is You are more than conquerors. You are more than conquerors. Except it doesn't always feel that way, does it? It does not always feel like, as Christians, we are triumphing. In fact, it so often feels like we're failing. It feels like we are losing that battle with indwelling sin. And we say to ourselves, why have I sinned again? Why have I done it again? And it feels like the gospel is losing the battle with progressive liberalism, which seems to be dominating our culture. And it feels like the true gospel of Christ is just getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed out of public life. And it feels like churches are losing the battle with the culture. And that's just in our own nation. When we look to other nations, it feels like Christians in other nations are losing the battle with repressive totalitarian governments. And in parts of the Middle East, it feels like Christians are losing the battle with militant Islam. And yet the Apostle Paul can still say, Clearly and without any hesitation, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, what gives Paul such confidence in saying this? What makes Paul so sure? Why is Paul so certain? Well, just one thing. The Lord Jesus Christ and all that he is and all that he has done. That's what gives Paul Such confidence. That's why Paul can say, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so as we look at these verses this morning, verses 33 through to verse 37 of Romans chapter 8, I want to show you four things. Four things that will prove to you that you are more than a conqueror if you are truly the Lord Jesus Christ's. And these four things will assure you that you are not a failure and you have not lost. And on the contrary, you have triumphed. You are triumphing in Christ Jesus. And these four things are going to be our four headings for the remainder of this sermon. First of all, you are not guilty. You're not guilty. And then secondly, you are not condemned. If you are in Christ, you are not condemned. Thirdly, you are not separated. You're not. You are not separated. And fourthly, you are not defeated. You are not defeated. You're not guilty. You're not condemned. You're not separated. And you're not defeated. First of all, then, you are not guilty. Just look at verse 33. Just read verse 33 with me in our text. And in verse 33, the Apostle Paul says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So let me just say right at the outset that Paul is speaking only about those people who belong to God. Paul calls them God's elect, 
When I say you are not guilty, I'm not speaking to all of you. For some of you are guilty. I'm speaking to those of you who are God's elect. You, you are God's people. You've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've repented of the sins that you have committed. And you've trusted in him. And the Apostle Paul says, now who shall bring any charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. So those who have genuinely repented of their sins and turned in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, they are God's elect. And Paul is not then speaking about the whole human race. He is speaking only and exclusively of those who have turned in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul then asks this question. He asks, who shall bring any charge against them? Who shall accuse them? Who shall initiate any judicial proceedings against God's people? And on one level, the answer is, well, there are plenty of people who will do that. Paul himself in his own life, faced many false accusations and false charges. Paul himself had been arrested several times and put on trial. And the other apostles, it's not like Paul was unique. The other apostles faced false charges and false trials. And Christians down through the history, down through the centuries of Christian history... They have been accused of many false things. They've been charged with many false things. And they have been imprisoned for their faith. But that is not what Paul is ultimately asking. For Paul knows, in the words of the Lord Jesus, that the opponents of the gospel will utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this will happen. They will utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account, said Jesus. And Paul knows that. Paul knows that. But Paul is saying that ultimately, eternally, the accusations will not succeed. He's saying that the greatest accuser of them all, Satan, will not ultimately succeed in his accusation. You know, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, Satan is referred to as the accuser, the ultimate accuser, the one who is behind all false accusations. And this is how Satan accuses you if you're a Christian. He says, you know, really, you're just a hypocrite, aren't you? Really, you're just a sinner. He says, really, your, your faith is too weak and too feeble. He says, really, you're a fake. He says, really, you're a phony. And we hear that voice within us. That is the accuser, Satan, accusing people. It's what Satan did with Job, wasn't it? Do you remember? God said to Satan, look at my servant Job. There is no one like him upon the earth. He is blameless in his generation. And what was Satan's response? It was to accuse him. It was to say, ah, oh, well, of course, Job loves you. You've given him such a good life. You've given him riches and a lovely family. And you've put a hedge of protection all around him. Nothing ever happens to Job. Of course he loves you. That's what Job is like. That's what Satan is like. He's the accuser. Now, what is the answer to charges like that, to these fake charges from Satan? When Satan charges you in that way and says, you're just a fake follower of God. Well, what is the Apostle Paul's answer? The Apostle Paul says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who justifies. God has the final decision. That's Paul's answer. In other words, if you are truly trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, then God has justified you. You are justified by God. And that means you've been declared innocent. You've been declared not guilty. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not a sinner or that you haven't committed many sins. 
you are a sinner, you have committed many sins. But in the sight of God, because you have faith in Christ, you are justified and declared not guilty. Despite your sin, despite your weakness, you are declared to be not guilty because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that's what Paul means when he says, well, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. You're not guilty if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a moment ago, I said that Satan is called the accuser in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And indeed, he is. But let me just read that verse to you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, because I think it sums up exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. For in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, we are told that there was a loud voice from the throne in heaven, and it declared that now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. And he accuses them day and night before our God, but they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 12, that the accuser has been cast down because they have conquered him in the blood of the Lamb. So the next time you hear Satan accusing you, The next time he lays up false charges against you and accuses you of being weak and faithless and sinful and a hypocrite and a fake and a phony, you tell him you are saved by the blood of the Lamb and he is being cast down and he has no right to bring any charges against you for it is God who justifies. (coughs) You are not guilty. Now that's the first way in which we are more than conquerors. You are not guilty. Now here's the second way. Here is heading number two for this morning. You are not condemned. You are not condemned. But just read verse 34 with me now. Look at verse 34. And in verse 34, the Apostle Paul says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed is interceding for us. So the Apostle Paul, having asked who can bring any charge against you, now asks, well, who can condemn you? Who will condemn God's people? Who will pronounce judgment against those whom Christ has saved? Because that's what it means by God's people. And again, we say, as we said before, that at a superficial and a worldly level, well, there are lots of people who will condemn you for following Christ. There will be lots of people who will judge you because you're a Christian. You know, the liberal progressives (coughs) will condemn evangelical Christians for being unloving bigots. And the aggressive atheists will condemn you for being brainless nutjobs who believe in myths like creation and the flood and the virgin birth and the resurrection of Christ. And they stand in judgment and they think, well, you're all just crazy. And maybe your colleagues at work, maybe your friends, your family, maybe your neighbors, Maybe your fellow students at university, maybe they all stand in judgment over you when you tell them you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that isn't what Paul means. When Paul says, who will condemn us, it doesn't mean that we'll go through life without anyone ever judging us. For Paul himself has experienced all the hostility of people standing in judgment over him and condemning him. And Paul himself knows exactly what that feels like. But Paul is saying in the final analysis, in the ultimate and eternal sense, no one can condemn you if you are in Christ. No one can stand in judgment over you. No one, not a single person can pass sentence against you or convict you if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
For you are not condemned. Now how can Paul be so sure of this? How can Paul be so confident? How can he say this with such assurance? Well, Paul gives us four reasons for why you are not condemned. First of all, you're not condemned because Christ died for you. That's what Paul says in verse 34. Just look again at verse 34. And in verse 34, Paul says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Christ Jesus is the one who died. And that means that the death of Christ upon the cross has saved his people from condemnation. There's no one to condemn me because Christ has taken my condemnation that was fully deserved. He's taken it on the cross. And that's what Paul said at the very first verse of this chapter. In chapter 8 verse 1 he opens the chapter by saying there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. So that's the first reason that Paul gives for his confidence in the fact that you are not condemned. Christ has died. Here's the second reason. Christ was raised. Just look at verse 34 again. And in verse 34 Paul says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who was raised? So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ shows us that Jesus has indeed victory over sin and death. And it shows us that his, vict that his death upon the cross was indeed acceptable to the Father. For the Father raised him and brought him back to life. And that means that if we have faith in Christ, if we put all of our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are united to him and all that he is and all that he has achieved so that we share in that same victory. We share in his victory over death. Therefore, we cannot be condemned to death. Paul says, you're not condemned for Christ has been raised. So there's two reasons for Paul's great confidence that you are not condemned. Christ died for you. He was raised for you. But Paul is not yet finished. He has yet another reason that he is so confident. Look deeper into verse 34. And in verse 34 Paul says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. In other words, not only has Christ died and been raised, but Christ ascended and is now in a position of complete authority. He is at the right hand of God. And that's what being at the right hand of the Father means. It means you are standing in a place which tells us that everything is under the control of Christ, that everything has been put under him. He is the head over everything. So therefore, no one can condemn you. For Christ is the one who is at the right hand of the Father. So there you have three reasons for Paul's great confidence. Christ died for you. Christ rose for you. Christ ascended for you. Now here's one more reason. The last reason for Paul's great confidence that you are not condemned. Look at the way he ends verse 34. Just read verse 34 one last time. And this I really think this, I really think, is where Paul is aiming for in this verse. Paul says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And that means that Jesus is appealing and he is petitioning the Father on behalf of the people whom he has saved. Jesus is our advocate. He is our lawyer in heaven. And he is the greatest lawyer you could ever have. And he is advocating with the Father. Jesus is pleading for you day and night. So no one can condemn you. For you have the Lord Jesus Christ interceding for you. Now what, what is the Lord Jesus Christ praying as he intercedes for you in heaven? Well, we get a glimpse into the kind of things that the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for. We get a glimpse of that in John chapter 17. Let me just read to you 
the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. For Jesus prays like this. He says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost. Now, that's just a flavor of the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf. That's the type of prayer that Jesus is praying for you now, if you truly belong to him. He is interceding for you. Now, this is why the Apostle Paul can say with great confidence, you are not condemned if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. This world cannot condemn you, not ultimately. This world cannot sit in judgment over you, not ultimately, not eternally, because Christ has died for you. Because Christ has risen for you. Because Christ ascended into glory for you, to prepare a place for you. And because right now he is interceding on your behalf. So you are not condemned, not if you have truly repented and have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning we're looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 37. And these verses are telling you, you are more than conquerors. First of all, you're not guilty. Secondly, you are not condemned. Now thirdly, here's heading number three. And you are not separated. Not separated. So just look at verse 35 and verse 36. Let's just read those two verses together. Verse 35 and verse 36. And in verse 35 and 36, the apostle Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So once again, the Apostle Paul asks another rhetorical question. He now asks, having first asked, who shall bring any charge against us? And then secondly, having asked, and who shall condemn us? And now thirdly, he asks, and who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is, no one and nothing. No one and nothing shall separate you from the love of Christ if you truly belong to him. We've already sung it to each other and to God. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. If you have truly repented of your sins and turned in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, he loves you with an everlasting love, and he will not let you go. Earlier in our service, we sang another hymn. O love of God, how strong and true. It is eternal and yet ever new. It's it's uncomprehended. That means you, you can't even wrap your mind around it. And it is unbought. That means we didn't buy it. It was given as a gift. And it's beyond all knowledge. It's beyond all thought. Oh, love of God, how strong and true. And Paul says, tribulation will not separate you from that love. And that means that whatever trouble you may be in today, whatever financial troubles you may have, whatever family troubles you're going through, whatever health troubles you are currently facing, It will not separate you from the love of Christ. Regardless of your tribulations, you will always be joined to the love of Christ. 
In fact, it is the love of Christ that will carry you through your tribulations. And Paul says, distress will not rip you away from the love of Christ. So no matter how worried and miserable you may be, no matter how much pain and agony you may be in, Christ's love still encompasses you. Paul says that persecution will never drive a wedge between you and the love of Christ. So that no matter how much hostility you face in your workplace or amongst your family or in this culture, it can never get in the way of Christ's love towards you. (coughs) Paul says that famine or nakedness cannot disconnect you from the love of Christ. Which means that even if you were to lose everything, Even if you were to lose the most basic necessities of life, which is food and clothing, even if your daily bread was to be taken away from you and and the clothes taken from off your back, even if you were destitute and utterly penniless, even so you are filled and clothed with the love of Christ. And Paul says, and when you feel in danger, When you feel that your very life is at risk and that you are in great peril, even then the love of Christ is keeping you. And even when you face the point of a sword, even though someone may have a knife to the throat of a Christian and is threatening to behead them because they belong to Christ, even then the love of Christ is with them. They'll never be separated from the love of Christ. Do you see what Paul is saying? He is saying to those of you who truly belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing in this world that can ever stop him loving you. And that means dementia won't separate a Christian from the love of Christ. Nor will cancer. Nor will redundancy or joblessness separate you. Neither will loneliness or childlessness separate you from the love of Christ. Nor will bereavement or grief or heartbreak or unfaithfulness or disappointment or depression can ever separate you from the love of Christ. Now what are we saying? Are we saying that, hey, the Christian life is easy? Does this mean that we can just float around on a cloud of endless joy and happiness? Well, not at all. The Apostle Paul is realistic and he knows from his own personal experience just how hard it is to be a servant of Christ in this fallen world. And that's why he quotes from Psalm 44. He says, for your sake, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as nothing but Sheep to be slaughtered. But nevertheless, he says, yet nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. So this morning we're looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 37. And these verses are telling you that if you are truly a Christian, you are more than conquerors. How can we be sure? Well, first, because you're not guilty. Second, Because you're not condemned. Third, because you're not separated. Now fourthly, and finally for this morning, here's heading number four. You are not defeated. You are not defeated. But just look at verse 37. Just read verse 37 with me. And in verse 37, the Apostle Paul says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, if I were to ask most people, what does a defeated person look like? If I were to ask them to describe a defeated person, they may say something like this. Well, a defeated person is someone who faces tribulation and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword. That's what a defeated person looks like. Is that what the Apostle Paul thinks? Certainly not. Paul says, no, in all those things, we are more than conquerors. 
A Christian is someone who is not defeated by these things. In fact, the very opposite is true. We are not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors in these things. Now, what is a conqueror? A conqueror is someone who utterly defeats his enemy and has complete and total victory. Now, those of you who know your British history will have heard of William the Conqueror. And he won the Battle of Hastings in 1066, came across from Normandy uh, and across the English Channel and uh, landed and had a battle at Hastings and the Normans consequently conquered England. Now that's a conqueror to win a decisive battle and then take complete control. Well, here in verse 37, the Apostle Paul says, we are more than conquerors. It is not that you will just about survive your tribulations. It's not that you will just about scrape by. It's not that you will barely manage to endure as a Christian. No, not at all. The Apostle Paul says you will triumph with a thumping victory. You will be utterly successful. For you will win and you will win with a landslide. For you are more than conquerors. Don't you see? You're not defeated. And the gospel is not defeated. And the church of Christ is not defeated. Not if you truly belong to him. You have the victory. But I don't want any of you to think that it's your victory. Having said all of these encouraging things, I don't want you to think that you do it. That you earn this victory yourself. For you did not win the battle, did you? You didn't fight the battle. The battle was fought for you. You did not do this yourself. You have not achieved this by your own strength. For just look at carefully at what the Apostle Paul says. For look again at verse 37. Just read verse 37 again and pay close attention to the words at the very end. For in verse 37, the Apostle Paul says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's through him who loved us. It is through the love of Christ. That you are not defeated. It's through him. It is by him. It is because of him. And it is only by faith in him. And you being joined to him. That you can become more than conquerors. It is only through Christ that you have victory. But just listen to what the Apostle Paul says. In his letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. The Apostle Paul says. Thanks be to God. Who gives us the victory, gives us the victory. It is a gift who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Your victory that you have, it is a gift of God. It is given to God's people. You did not earn it. You do not really deserve it. But it is his gracious gift to you. And it is given to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if the Lord Jesus Christ is not your saviour this morning, if you've not truly repented of all your sins and turned in complete faith and trust and have put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot claim this victory. There is no victory for you unless you have come in repentance and faith to Christ. For our victory comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Or consider these words of Jesus recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 33. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's why you should take heart. It's not that, look, you will have tribulation in this world, but don't worry, you'll overcome it. Jesus says, you will have tribulation in this world, but take heart, for I have overcome it. I have overcome the world, says the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question really is, does Christ 
love you? Are you joined to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you really repented of all your sins? Don't nudge the person next to you and ask them whether they've done it. I'm asking you. I'm asking you whether you have repented of your sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Did he die for your sins? And was he raised to life so that you might share in his victory over death? And did he ascend into heaven to prepare a place for you? And is he interceding right now for you specifically? It's no good just thinking of Jesus in general terms. You, you can't just say, well, you, you know, yes, I believe there was a man called Jesus 2,000 years ago. And yes, I believe he died on a cross in Jerusalem. And uh, yes, I, I do believe actually that he rose and is, and is in heaven. For I am asking you a much more, a much deeper, much more profound question than that. A much more personal question than that. I'm asking every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl in this congregation here this morning, did he do these things for you? And if your answer is yes, if your answer is yes, I believe he did, despite all of my sin, despite all of my weakness, he did these things for me. Then you can say this morning, with all the authority of the Bible, that you are more than a conqueror. For you really are not guilty. And you really are not condemned. And you never will be separated from his love. And you will not be defeated. You are more than conquerors. Amen.